Stocks versus bonds is one of the most hotly debated topics within the investing world. Some argue that any healthy diversified portfolio should have bonds, while others argue that bonds have become completely useless in the era of zero interest rates. And one of the most ruthless critics of bonds over the years has been none other than Warren Buffett. Definitely, if you had your choice between buying and holding a 30-year bond for 30 years or holding a basket of American stocks, there's just no question you're going to do better. It's very hard for an unproductive investment to beat productive investments over any long period of time. And, oh, is uh, we think that long-term bonds are a terrible investment. But despite these scathing remarks in the past, it seems that Buffett has largely shifted his tune over the past 12 months. In fact, he came into 2023 holding $95 billion worth of treasury bills. And as of August, he was buying up $10 billion worth of treasury bills every single week. For perspective, Buffett's largest investment is Apple, where he holds $164 billion. And his second largest investment is Bank of America, where he holds $27 billion. So Buffett's bet on treasury bills squarely places it as his second largest investment. In fact, he has even gone as far as selling off his stock portfolio while continuing to buy treasuries. This kind of makes Buffett seem like a hypocrite, but in his defense, his remarks against bonds were made in a completely different investing landscape in the era of 0% interest rates. Ever since the 2008 financial crisis, the Federal Reserve has kept interest rates at near zero levels in an effort to boost spending and bolster the economy. But last year, the Fed made a 180 degree pivot and started raising rates at a record pace to historically high levels of over 5%. As such, treasury yields and corporate bond yields have been consistently reaching new highs over the past several months. Combine this with the worst inflation we've seen in the past 40 years peaking at just over 9%, and it's no wonder why investors have adopted a vastly different outlook when it comes to stocks versus bonds. So join me as we take a deep dive into the case for stocks versus the case for bonds in the era of high inflation and high interest rates. If this video piques your interest in bond investing, please consider checking out our upcoming app, Silo, in the description below. But anyway, starting off with the case for stocks, likely the most obvious factor that immediately meets the eye is the stock market sell-off over the past two years. Many household names sold off 50-75% to or even more. For example, Google sold off 45%, Meta sold off 77%, Netflix sold off 78%, and even the whole Nasdaq sold off 38%. Normally, this would be a disadvantage, but if you were consistently investing throughout the downtrend, you would have been rewarded with a massive recovery. For example, Netflix has rocketed 178%, Meta has rocketed 272%, and some stocks have even gone on to make new all-time highs like Nvidia, who has grown 364% from the bottom. Now of course, no one knows when such rallies will happen, and trying to time the market is a massive mistake. But not investing in the market is also a massive mistake. Usually the best way to go about these situations is to simply dollar cost average into your favorite companies and bet on their long term growth. And in that vein, this strategy should not change due to rising or falling interest rates. With the S&P 500 for example, just missing the 10 best days over a 30 year period would wipe out over half of your returns. So if you already have a solid stock investing plan in place, it's best that you stick with this plan. Any other investment should be done in addition to this plan, not in replacement of this plan. Speaking of this massive recent recovery, we have the second advantage for stocks, which is that stocks simply have potential for far higher returns. Likely the highest returns that you can currently earn with an investment grade corporate bond is 8%, which fares quite well next to the S&P 500. But when we take a look at this next to individual stocks, it's a whole different story. If you were investing in Facebook, Apple, Google, Netflix, and Nvidia over the past 10 years for example, you would have 5 to 10 x your money. Now of course, it could have just as easily gone the other way. For example, other household names like Intel, Cisco, and AT&T haven't gone anywhere in the past 23 years. But that's simply part of the stock game, you take on higher risk for higher returns. 
If you're okay with this risk, stocks are still the way to go to potentially get outsized returns of 5x or 10x. Also, outsized returns aren't the only reason to invest in stocks. If you're a more conservative investor, you could stick with the dividend stocks, which sort of give you the best of both worlds. There's a few dozen companies that swear by their dividends. Exxon, for example, hasn't missed a dividend payment since the 1800s when they started paying a dividend. And it's a similar case with Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, and several other companies as well. These companies are so consistent with their dividends that it's almost like a bond coupon payment. And the best part is that you're not limited to these dividends. If the company itself is growing consistently, you may see strong stock returns as well, as was the case with Johnson & Johnson. So if you already have a solid stock investing plan, are looking for higher returns, or are interested in dividend stocks, there is a pretty strong case to be made to continue investing in stocks. But like with any other investment, stocks have their own set of disadvantages as well. Starting off with the elephant in the room, we have record high inflation and interest rates, which have historically been very bad for stock market returns. Take 1968 to 1982 for example. During this time period, inflation peaked over 10% on two separate occasions, and interest rates reached nearly 20%. Do you want to guess what the S&P 500 did during this time period? Well, if you guessed that it stayed completely flat, then you'd be right. Throughout this period, the S&P 500 spent some time above 100 and a lot of time below 100, but for the most part, it couldn't really break past $100. To make things worse, this period also saw four major stock market crashes. The first one was 37%, the second one was 50%, the third one was 20%, and the fourth one was 28%. And if you thought that things couldn't get any worse, well, we still haven't accounted for inflation. Something that cost just $1 in 1968 would cost $2.77 by 1982, meaning that the value of the dollar fell by over 60%. In other words, by staying flat, the S&P 500 also lost 60% of its real value. And when you take a look at how high inflation affects companies, this really isn't all that surprising. Like all of us, companies also struggle during periods of high inflation. All we see from the consumer side is prices going up across the board. But the thing to keep in mind is that prices are also going up on the back end for these companies. And this hurts companies in two fronts. For one, companies may not be able to raise consumer prices as much as their back end prices are going up, leaving them with lower profit margins. And two, due to higher prices, less consumers are willing to buy their products. But all of that is just half the story. You see, when inflation starts getting out of control, the Fed likes to step in and jack up interest rates to cool down the economy. And for high growth companies who rely on debt and venture capital to keep growing, this is a disaster. Given that much of tech is exactly this, high inflation and high interest isn't exactly a great omen for the stock market. Something else that isn't a great omen is the massive bull market that we just completed. It's no secret that the stock market is quite cyclical. It has boom periods and bust periods. The 70s was a bust period, the 80s and 90s were a boom period, the 2000s was a bust period, and the 2010s was a boom period. In fact, between 2009 and 2021, the S&P 500 grew over 600%. Combine this with a shifting investing landscape, and we could be heading into another bust period. Now of course, past performance is not an indicator of future results, and you shouldn't be trying to time the market anyway. But this may be a good time to diversify your portfolio into other investment classes if you haven't already, and that brings us into the case for bonds. Interestingly enough, the case for bonds is quite similar to the case against stocks. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Federal Reserve decided to pause their 18-month long rate hike bonanza. According to the Fed, inflation statistics are looking favorable, meaning that there's a strong chance that we have a soft landing. But this historic war on inflation has brought the American economy to interest rates of 5.25 to 5.5%. Here's a few examples of this in the real world. Mortgage rates are as high as 7.41%. Used car loan rates are at 8.06%. 
New car loan rates are at 7.46%, credit card interest rates are at 20.71%, and so on. All of these examples have to do with us paying higher rates. But we can also use this situation to our advantage and earn higher rates on investments such as savings accounts, CDs, money markets, and of course, bonds. Just by keeping your money in a savings account, you can earn 4.75% at Betterment, 4.5% at SoFi, 4.3% at American Express, and 4.3% at Capital One. Now, you might be thinking, doesn't the stock market return 8-10%? to Well, surprisingly, for the first time in a long time, S&P 500 returns have matched the yield of a 2-year treasury note. And this parity becomes even more significant when we account for inflation. In 2022, for example, not only did inflation peak at over 9%, but the S&P 500 also sold off as much as 27%. So stock investors were feeling pain from two fronts, inflation and a sell-off. And this is where bonds may be able to help. Bonds give you something that the stock market rarely does, stability. Holding government or highly rated corporate bonds to maturity means consistent interest payments, typically semi-annually and a repayment of your principal value. And just like how us individuals can get crucified for missing those credit card payments or mortgage payments, companies can also find themselves in murky waters if they miss or skip an interest payment on a bond. You see, while companies can raise money by issuing either stocks or bonds, they have a contractual obligation to pay back bondholders, and this is captured in the pecking order. Companies are required to prioritize debt known as senior and junior debt as their number one priority. Conversely, dividend disbursements on common stock is last priority. In other words, paying dividends is a good faith effort, while paying back bondholders is a legal obligation. This is especially important if a company ends up bankrupt. In such a scenario, what happens is that the assets the company does still have get liquidated into cash and distributed down the priority ladder till there's no cash left. Usually, the debt gets paid back in some form of compensation, but the stock becomes completely worthless. As such, the case for bonds often lies in an environment where stability is more achievable than growth. And the current tumultuous market with high inflation and high interest is the perfect example of such an environment. Investing in bonds now means locking in rates that get paid out for the lifetime of the bond, whether that be 30 days, 2 years, or even 30 years. Conversely, savings account rates only last as long as the Fed keeps interest rates high, and stock market returns aren't exactly predictable. So if you're looking for stable, consistent returns, it doesn't get much better than bonds. Clicking on this video, a lot of you were probably hoping to get a definitive answer between bonds and stocks. And I'm sorry to disappoint, but the truth is that there is no definitive answer, and Warren Buffett has always known this. While some of his statements and actions may seem super against bonds or super pro bonds, the reality is that he's always had a balance of stocks, bonds, and cash regardless of the investing environment. For example, in the same clip that Buffett claims that long-term bonds are a terrible investment at near zero interest rates, he immediately turns around and he says that all of their money is in treasury bills. The one thing we know is we think that long-term bonds are a terrible investment and uh, we, at current rates or anything close to current rates, uh, so basically all of our money that is waiting to be placed is is in is in treasury bills that i think have an average maturity of four months or something like that at most uh so the reality is that there is no one size fits all and the answer of stocks versus bonds is much more nuanced and dependent on your age income net worth risk tolerance and a slew of other factors but if you're looking for a general rule the rule of 100 may be of value the rule of 100 basically suggests that an investor's bond holdings should be directly proportional to their age. So if you're 30 years old for example, you should have 30% in bonds and 70% in stocks. If you're 40 years old, you should have 40% in bonds and 60% in stocks and so on and so forth. This strategy ensures that when you're younger and have a higher risk appetite, most of your portfolio is invested in stocks with high return potential. Conversely, when you're older and you value stability and reliable income, it ensures that most of your portfolio is invested in stable bonds. 
So if you don't own any bonds at all, it may be a good idea to look into bonds whether that's through Silo or some other platform, especially with high inflation and high interest rates. But this isn't to say that you should shy away from any stock investing plan that you already have in place. And that's the truth about stocks versus bonds in the era of high interest. It looks like big tech companies can't get their hands on enough bonds. If you want to learn more, check out this video. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.